Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, which is the second of our three-part series on ServoPress technology. Uh, the webinar series is sponsored by Stamtech, Komatsu, Sei Presses, and Hyson, and hosted by Metal Forming Magazine. My name is Brad Coogan. I'm the editor of Metal Forming, and I'm pleased to serve as your moderator for today's webinar. Since uh, today's go-to meeting is being recorded for archiving, all participants are in listen-only mode. That means that the speaker and other listeners cannot hear any audio from your site during the program. However, you do have the ability to communicate with us throughout the program by submitting your questions using the question box, which is located in that right-hand control panel on your screen. Simply type your question to an organizer uh, as selected from the drop-down menu. Also, before we get started, I want to let everybody know that we will have a link uh, to the recorded webinar available on our website within the next day or two. Uh, and when we get that uh, up on our website, you'll get an email from us uh, letting you know how to find it so you can share the uh, program uh, with, with coworkers. Uh, also, before we get started, I want to invite everyone to attend the final webinar in the three-part series, which is scheduled for next week, September 17th, and to also attend our live event uh, on Servo Press Technology, which is a half-day event coming up on Tuesday, October 13th in Troy, Michigan. Uh, at that event, you'll hear more presentations on servo press technology, uh, and you'll have an opportunity to network with uh, thought leaders throughout the industry on servo press technology and its applications in metal forming. More details on the last webinar and on the live event are available on our website, metalformingmagazine.com slash servo. Now it's time to be in today's webinar. Presenting today is Lee Ellard. Lee is National Sales Manager for Stemtech Inc. His presentation is titled Hydraulic, Mechanical, or Mechanical Servo Presses, Which Press is Right for You? So please welcome Lee Ellard. Okay, thank you for the applause, everyone. <coughs> um, Brad, thanks for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, and as Brad said, welcome to the webinar. The uh, purpose of this webinar is to give you a basic overview of standard mechanical presses, including link motion presses and servo mechanical presses, address some of the strengths and weaknesses of each, and compare the two. Um, the ultimate goal is to get you to think about your current applications, your budget, and your possible future needs, and determine which press is right for you. Stamtech and most other press manufacturers sell both types of presses, so my, my intent truly is to help you, just help you make the best decision for your particular set of circumstances. So which press is right for you? Well, press selection, of course, depends on a lot of variables, but generally, a hydraulic press offers more control and versatility, especially in deep forming. A traditional mechanical press can achieve the highest production speeds at a given stroke length. We'll qualify that more later. A mechanical servo press combines the ultimate in control and versatility for stamping and forming better parts while maintaining or even increasing production speeds. Now, I should say I'm going to speak just a few moments about hydraulic presses uh, because they do have some uh, good points to be made uh, regarding uh, particular applications, especially as how, how they relate to a mechanical press, which they do have some different characteristics. A hydraulic press does not achieve the high cycling speeds of a similar size mechanical press, but offers more versatility in its variable stroke length, die space, tonnage, and working energy often the best choice for producing deep drawn parts or parts that require a dwell or uh, a lot of forming or a dwell at the bottom such as these parts. So the characteristics of a typical hydraulic press, variable stroke length. So if the hydraulic press has a 20 inch stroke, you can use from zero inches to 20 inches of that stroke as the working stroke as you have the full tonnage throughout the entire stroke length, not just at bottom dead center. Control of slide of position and motion, meaning you can start and stop the stroke at any point in the, in the die space and vary the movement at any time and any point in the die space. Speed up, slow down, dwell, reverse, etc. Variable slide velocity, even within a single cycle of the press, which is typically fast approach, slow press, and fast return. And uh, that can actually be. The speed can be adjusted and controlled at any point depending on how advanced the press controls and hydraulics are in the particular press, but they're generally, generally uh, configured 
as I said, fast approach, slow press, and fast return. Now, for full working at energy speed, this is this is a big bonus of the hydraulic press, especially when forming, as you can do slow draws, reverses, and dwells to help the material flow. Full press capacity at any point in the stroke. Another big difference between a hydraulic press and a mechanical press or a servo press for that matter. Full tonnage at any point in the stroke. So you can you can use maximum die space, uh, working height, die height, working stroke are all variable within the entire range of the stroke length. And full adjustability and programmability of the all of the above. Now with older hydraulic presses, this may not be the case. But with modern press controls and some hydraulic press manufacturers are even even combining servo motors with their hydraulic systems, so they're more flexible and have more capabilities than ever before, and relatively low initial cost. Now, so with all of the above and low cost, you might ask, what is the problem with hydraulic presses? Why are hydraulic presses not used more in stamping? In reality, they probably could be used in more stamping applications, but there are some real limitations that keep hydraulic presses from being more widely utilized. Among them are generally reduced throughput accuracy and repeatability compared to a mechanical or servo press, more issues with snap through, parallelism, rigidity, deflection than a mechanical or servo press. You see, hydraulic presses. Um, obviously have hydraulic cylinders, so they, they're they just uh, not hard mechanical gears and crankshafts. So the cylinders constantly need to adjust for off-center loading, changes in loading across the bed and slide as the parts are stamped in form, uh, deflection, snap through, etc. So even with super strong gibbing and side frames, they may not be enough to handle all the potential forces generated in a stamping operation. Uh, and these hydraulic system adjustments, which involve electric sig electrical signals, transducers, cell noise, hydraulic valve flow and pressure, etc., they take time and distance, creating inaccuracies within the stroke. And the press must be the press stroke must also be slowed down to allow time for these changes to take place. And these uh, adjustments become even more challenging with sudden changes such as snap through. Not to mention, you know the havoc that's wreaked by vibrations and forces being driven back through the hydraulic system. So hydraulic presses have their place, but most often it is not in a true stamping operation. Uh, for example, I know a company personally that runs a hydraulic press and a transfer press operation. They can only get about 15 strokes per minute, whereas a more compar a comparable mechanical press would get about 25 strokes a minute. So for the rest of the uh, after the uh, webinar here, I'm going to concentrate on mechanical and mechanical servo presses. So a traditional mechanical press at a given stroke length can usually achieve the greatest production speeds, especially when running relatively flat parts with simple shallow forming requirements. So the characteristics of a typical mechanical press, which most of us probably know, but it's worth review. Fixed stroke length. All the variable stroke length presses are available. Now, several press manufacturers make variable stroke length presses, but wh whoever makes it, you actually have to rotate the cam on the crankshaft, either manually or by a powered mechanism. So either way, it's kind of a pain. It's an expensive option. So there have not been a lot of these variable stroke mechanical presses built or sold. Of course, you have a variable speed range in the press, but the slide velocity with a single cycle of the press is fixed. Working energy depends on flywheel and mass, mass and speed. So most mechanical presses achieve full working energy at the mid-range of the speed range. So like in a 20 to 40 stroke per minute press, you would have full working energy at 30 strokes per minute and above. Anything below that, 30 strokes per minute, working energy drops off quickly, and you may not have enough energy to get through the work, even if you have plenty of tonnage, or you may not have enough motor to replenish the flywheel with energy in time for the next working stroke. Have you ever had a press bogged down during a job? Well, that's why it's actually nothing to do with 
tonnage usually, but rather not having enough working energy. And the furl press tonnage is only near bottom dead center, as we all know, from an eighth inch to a half inch typically for a mechanical press. Anything above that rating point, your press's ability to generate and withstand that much tonnage drops off significantly. Now, tonnage and working energy alone are enough to do a, a seminar all by itself on, but we're not going to get into too much detail with that today. I'd be happy to talk to you more about it at any time if you want to give me a call after the webinar. Of course, the mechanical press is very simple to set up and operate. As you know, it's pretty much you set the die height, set the speed, and start running parts. Not a lot of complicated settings for the press itself, although, of course, you may use complex feeding and automation systems, die protection, tonnage monitors, etc. Typically, the high stroking speeds, that again is with a given stroke length. Everything's hard and mechanical. You get plenty, get it set, um, get it pretty much set dead nuts, and then it's highly repeatable. There are special slide motions such as link motion available, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Uh, relatively low initial cost as compared to uh, a servo mechanical press. I'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. So, servo press technology was introduced only a few years ago, but the basic question has always existed. And I'm sure you've all asked this yourselves many times. How can I successfully make parts faster but using a slower slide velocity for better part, quality of parts, less problems with equipment, dies, etc., and within my equipment budget? Well, in some cases, the answer was and still may be a type of press that has enjoyed popularity over the years and seen that we've actually seen a lot of renewed interest in this press in part fueled by the uh, interest in servo presses. It would be the standard mechanical press with link motion. You see a couple of typical, typical applications right here. First is where a link motion is utilized in a multi-station transfer press. This one actually has a feed line and a transfer system on it. Uh, you know, some of the stations have a lot of forming in them, so the link motion, which I'll explain a little bit more later, uh, helps to form those parts much better. And then the sec second one there is a uh, tandem line where the lead press does the majority of the forming and then the following presses are standard eccentric gear drive machines. So link motion technology decreases the slide velocity by up to 40% during the working portion of the stroke. Material flows more effectively and then the slide velocity increases during the non-working portion of the stroke. So you've got a better quality part at higher production speeds. In addition, the slower split speed through the working stroke reduces die impact, punch penetration, snap through noise, vibration, and so on, increasing uh, machine and die life potentially. But there are several different types of link mechanisms. The first one is a Watts type link mechanism, which we'd use on longer stroke eccentric geared machines like the ones you saw in the previous photo. Second type is a crankshaft type or Centric shaft type link mechanism. Shorter stroke, higher speeds typically for progressive dies. And then we also have, it's not technically a link motion, but it is a type of link motion, a knuckle joint, which is used often in forging or coining or near net shape or fine blanking presses. Now these all have slightly different stroke curves, but all have common characteristics of a fast approach slow press and or dwell through the work, then a fast return, all achieved by simple, very robust and accurate mechanical link mechanism without complicated controls or setup. But rather than showing you the graphic curves of all these, I'm just going to show you some examples uh, using some AutoCAD animations and actual videos of presses running. Again, this first one is the uh, eccentric geared link motion machine. Watts bar type used in large transfer presses and tandem lines. As you can see, this is a plunger guided machine, and that plunger 
you can watch how slowly it goes through the bottom of the stroke there and then fast back around the top, all enabled by the, the link mechanism you, you see attached to the crankshaft or the eccentric here. The second type would be a faster, shorter stroke machine, which is typical in a more aggressive die application. And you'll notice this is a high speed machine, although we've got it running slow here for the demo. Uh, when you get these high speeds being thrown around, the uh, slide being thrown around um, in a link motion at high speeds, a lot of times you'll need to add in dynamic balancing, which is what you see right here to offset the uh, inertia forces being created by that high speed link motion. And this last one is a knuckle joint press or coining press. I skipped forward in that. And you can see that you have, actually have a pullback link which extends this knuckle joint fully and, and provides a little dwell on the bottom as well as, of course, a lot of torque at the bottom, but a, a dwell of a significant dwell at the bottom to allow the material to compress and coin. And one more, just a little bit slower motion version of it. Now I've actually got some video of the presses running these same different link motions. This press is running relatively slow, so it's a bit difficult to see these slow down through the bottom, but you can't, if you'll notice, it is slowing down significantly through the bottom of the stroke, and it's equipped with the transfer system, as you see here. You've got a nice speed up back out of the work and through the top of the stroke. Now this is the crankshaft or eccentric shaft type of link motion press, and as you can see, much higher speed, a significant slowdown during the bottom of the stroke, so you can run a lot faster and produce some nice parts yet at the same time. Here this press is really moving out here at about 70 strokes per minute, but again, slowing down to by 30 or 40 percent during the working portion of the stroke. Now, a mechanical servo press, you notice we say mechanical because it is still a mechanical press. The only difference, basically, is that the flywheel, clutch and brake have been replaced by high capacity servo motors. So you've got a lot of the versatility of a hydraulic press with the, um, but at production speeds that often approach a mechanical press, traditional mechanical press. Stroke slide position and motion and speed are programmable to allow different combinations that can work with a variety of dies, part types, and production speeds. And here is, you see three models. One is the D-frame link motion machine, link assisted machine, then a couple of direct drive machines, which we're going to talk about that more in just a minute the differences in the servo presses. So the characteristics of a servo press, variable programming stroke, pile, stroke pro profiles with precise control of slide position and motion throughout the range of the stroke, variable precise control of the slide velocity even within a single cycle of the press stroke, full working energy at any speed. So you see, it's much like a very advanced hydraulic press, but with much greater speed, accuracy, and flexibility. And all these parameters can be controlled very precisely and quickly as compared to hydraulic presses. And you actually, you cannot control these with a standard mechanical press.
full press tonnage capacity only near bottom dead center of the stroke. So again, it's not a hydraulic press, it's a mechanical press. So you have the typical rating point of a quarter to half or an eighth to a half inch depending on the, the model. Greater operating cycle speeds than a hydraulic press, in some cases approaching or actually exceeding the speed of a traditional mechanical press when you get the uh, stroke profile dialed in perfectly. High accuracy and repeatability. And this is, of course, because, again, a mechanical press, but also coupled with all the, uh, all the parameters that you can tweak and set and refine with the servo control technology. So relatively high initial cost, you know, this could be anywhere from 40% to 100% higher than a mechanical press, depending on the size, model, specifications, and application requirements. For example, a typical 600-ton press might be in the $800,000 range for a 600-ton mechanical, but a comparable servo might be 1.2 to 1.8 million. Now there are basically two types of servo drive systems that are employed by today's uh, press manufacturers. And we offer both types at Stamtech and some other manufacturers do as well. Um, some manufacturers use proprietary press controls. We happen to use Siemens as a well-proven, very advanced uh, servo supplier as you can imagine. Um, I'm going to just touch on a few points between the two types. The link or toggle assisted or knuckle joint, it's more cost effective solution because it utilizes standard off the shelf servo motors. And the link or toggle mechanism coupled with the motors creates mechanical ratios that allow the use of these standard size motors. For proprietary or custom built motors and motor controllers are not required in the smaller presses especially. You notice this, this uses a link mechanism, um, but this, the link mechanism is the same as we use in a link motion mechanical press, but for here it's for different reasons. Here it is for the mechanical advantage and enabling us to use the smaller motors, where in the standard mechanical press it's used to achieve the slide slowdown in the working portion of the stroke. And you'll notice in the small presses like this, you, you don't have a, a very large electrical cabinet and you have small motors. That's the big advantage in the link assisted type of servo press is the, uh, it actually is significantly less costly to build this press in this version than it is a direct drive. The, some of the advantages of link assisted servo presses, smaller motors, cost effective higher working energy compared to direct drive because of the mechanical advantage supplied by the link mechanism. A couple of the disadvantages, lower tonnage rating point at a less distance off bottom. So that's kind of interesting. The, the tonnage rating point is lower and the tonnage capacity drops off faster, although you have more working energy. I'd be happy to explain that in more detail if anyone wants, wants to talk about it later. And you've got to use the full stroke length in each full cycle. And in other words, there's no pendulum motion generally with the link-assisted servo presses. So if you have an 8-inch stroke machine, it's an 8-inch stroke machine. I mean, you can do all of the other special stroke motions and speeds down to and through the work, but after the work, you must complete the full revolution of the press with a link motion machine, link-assisted machine. So the direct drive system employs custom-built, higher-torque, low-RPM motors designed specifically for press applications. And you'll notice in this machine, which is just a little bit larger tonnage-wise machine than the last one, you have much larger electrical components and cabinetry, a lot, a much larger servo motor. So it is more costly to, uh, on the front end and also to operate than the link assisted version. 
some of the advantages of the direct drive versus the link motion. Higher rating point further off the bottom of the stroke. The ability to use shorter stroke length and higher speeds. In other words, the pendulum motion. One interesting thing about using the pendulum motion is, though, that you actually, the press tonnage may be actually derated based on how fast you're trying to run the pendulum motion. It's because you can generate a lot of heat in the drives from all the starting and stopping in a short pendulum motion. So when you know, heat derates the motor, so you actually would lose some of your working energy potentially in a direct drive machine if you're running at higher pendulum motion speeds. Now, I realize I may have raised more questions than I've answered, but I just hope this will encourage you to investigate more and think about, you know, your specific application and uh, what press might really fit for you. I'd be, again, happy to talk to anybody about this in more detail at some point. I wish we had more time, but uh, we only have a limited amount of time today. But regardless of the drive type, servo presses are run by control programs designed to create this wide variety of stroke profiles. And this is the exciting part about it. These are a few stroke prof profiles that were created specifically for some customers of ours. Number one and two, I think they're kind of speak for themselves. You can see how they quickly go down to the work, then slowly move through the work, and quickly back to top and back around to the work again. Number three, perforation or blanking mode. Of course, a super rapid approach goes through the work very quickly and then super rapid departure from the work as well. So that's good for perforation and blanking. Warm forming. This is an interesting one where we actually come down quickly to the die, close on the die, then the material heats up during this portion and then we work slowly through the material and back out quickly. This titanium camera case cannot be made without warm forming and without the slowing Servo press manufacturers, you'll have a lot of, we'll call them canned stroke profiles, which are uh, can be used for a lot of you know, the great majority of your work. And I want to show you just quickly um, what each of these might look like uh, in a video of a press running the mode. It's not running parts at this point, but you'll get a good idea of how the slide motion works. So the crank mode, just your typical standard mechanical stamping press mode, just a smooth, symmetrical, and you can see also right here in the uh, control what, what the resolver is actually reading that the slide is doing. Feeder mode. You actually see where you go through the material and then you pause after so that the feeder can feed along speed progression and uh, still be able to keep up with the press. You can see the pause right here and it's allowing the material to feed forward. Great if you have a long feed progression and you don't uh, and you're not able to run the press uh, in continuous at full speed. The drawing mode uh, as you can imagine, you're just basically going through the bottom of the work slowly. It's kind of like a mechanical link motion, fast around the top, slow through the bottom. And you can watch the 
fine blanking mode. This would be for parts that need to have very little shear and thicker, heavier materials. If you're familiar with fine blanking, you'll know that they don't have any shear on them. So this is the fine blanking mode where you get a low shear by going very slowly through the material or possibly even no shear for true fine blanking. Coining mode. This would simulate similar to the mechanical knuckle joint where you're actually coming down to the bottom slowly through the work and then dwelling on the bottom briefly to coin that material and compress it. In die heating mode, I explained this one just a moment ago, but here it is actually in action. Comes down. Right now you've got a, a heated die heating up. And then you just stroke through the material at a slow rate and back around. You know, if you can hear me, you might want to call back in. I'm sorry, we're going to try to get Lee back onto the audio here. Just hang with us. Yeah, Lee's calling back in right now, so just please bear with us for another 30 seconds. He'll be back on the line. Apologize for the inconvenience. There's a first time for everything. We haven't had this one before. Hello? Oh, you're back. Man, I apologize, everybody. <laughs> uh, you know, if you were falling oh, asleep, I woke you up. <laughs> <laughs> there's a first time uh, for everything. Sorry, you had to be the first one there. But go ahead, Lee, continue, please. Operator error there, I'll have to admit. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm not sure. Where did you cut off at? Pulse mode or? Um. Yeah, we saw the indi heating mode, so go ahead and pick up. From the post. One of them, as you can see, hits the material, backs off, hits the material, pushes and hits before going through the bottom. And then you go through the
and indicated on the press control there. Now the second pulse mode, very similar, but you'll see you actually just stop, then move forward a little bit, stop, move forward, and then cycle on around. So you're not backing off and re relieving the material, actually just applying pressure. And, uh, you know, both of these are good for extrusion and um, forming, uh, setting and forming. A swing forging mode, you'll, you'll see this and it looks similar to pendulum mode, but what it is is it swings back and forth a set number of times so you're doing a restrike on the material and then it cycles back around. So you might, you know you have to, you have to hit this particular part three times and then you can complete the cycle and you can run in a continuous swing forge mode but it's not a pendulum mode, not exactly. So you're hitting the same part, in this case, hitting the same part three or four times. Then you cycle back around and you hit it again. And as opposed to and similar to the pendulum mode, this is actually the mode where you're running in continuous, and this is running slow, but you can run it very rapidly. Uh, for a progressive die, you know, this machine here, you, if you have an eight inch stroke, you could just use two inches of the stroke and run it at a much higher speed. So this is the, the classic pendulum mode, which uh, a lot of people were very excited about having a press that can run you know, multiple stroke lengths and multiple speeds. So uh, I am really happy to have been here today. I apologize for um, any, the little technical difficulties there. And um, I know I probably raised a lot of questions and that's the whole idea here though, get you thinking. And you're welcome to ask questions of me today via the uh, text box with Brad or give me a call anytime. And I know the other press manufacturers are very willing to talk to you as well. And hopefully we'll see you up on October 13th. Brad? All right. Thank you, Lee, very much. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there's uh, a lot of questions out there when they start to see all these different modes and so forth. Um, there are a couple questions, but we've got plenty of time for folks to ask more, so go ahead and use that question box uh, located on that control panel down on the right side. Um, first question, Lee, is, um, you know, when you compare Link with, with Servo, you know, there is some similar um, performance characteristics there. Can you talk a little bit about what you see in the market in terms of applications for those two types of presses and where they overlap and where, you know, maybe the applications lead you towards servo versus link? Well, if you just absolutely just have a simple need to slow down through the work and still want to run your parts as fast as you can in a relatively simple progressive die, uh, the link motion is only about a 10 to 20 percent adder to a mechanical motion press, a standard mechanical press, whereas it, I mentioned before a uh, Servo press could be anywhere from 40% to 100% higher. So um, if you don't anticipate that you're going to be doing a lot of complicated work where the servo technology might be utilized, you might consider a link motion instead. That said, I really believe that as people learn how to use and build dies for servo presses, there, there are just going to be ways that you discover to use the servo press that you never thought of. And it all hinges on your on your tooling builders, really. Uh, I I equated to a few years ago when somebody you know people would say, well, what do I need a computer for? You know, you couldn't live with one now. Not quite the same analogy, but uh, you can see with all these different restrikes and and uh, reversing and slowing down at various points during the you you can slow this thing down to nothing and speed it up 
within the entire range at any point during that stroke profile. So there are, you, I think you'll be able to create create all kinds of creative ways to use the servo press in the future. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that answered it, but okay. Well, I'm sure we'll get somebody to chime in if they want more detail on that. Can you? So you talked a little bit about die design, die building to take advantage of servo. Uh, do you see customers producing um, or, or moving dies over from a crank motion press or a link motion over to a servo press, or does it really require a different approach to die design? Well, I think to get to fully utilize in the future, you're going to need to design dies thinking about what the servo press can do and thinking more vertically because you can you, you don't have to have so many stations in a die to do all these different operations if you think vertically about what you can do within the vertical stroke of a servo press. So I think die design will be important. But as far as existing dies, there's still a lot of cases I think where you can move over an existing die and still improve your performance a lot just by tweaking the speed of the servo press. Um, for instance, I mean you may be limited to 40 strokes per minute in your mechanical press, but this one particular station in your die or this one forming operation in your die, if you could just slow down just for that part and then speed up for the entire rest of the stroke, then you know you, you maybe you'll hit 60 strokes a minute. So um, again, you can tweak exactly where it, where you want to do the slowdown and the speed up within your stroke as opposed to uh, the mechanical, which you can't do it at all. The link motion, which you're limited to, limited to exactly what that link motion uh, is configured to mechanically. Okay, thank you. Um, the question is, why would a customer choose link versus direct drive servo? Does it purely come down to cost? Otherwise, the direct drive servo seems like a, as, as you, I think, explained, a superior design. So really, does it just come down to cost? I think it does. I mean, there there are other costs um, involved, which you need to consider as well. Um, you know, the servo presses require a, a lot uh, bigger electrical service on the front end, mm -hmm. and um, that can be an issue depending on you know, your particular situation with your electrical service that you're building. It's not a deal killer necessarily, but it's just something that you need to be aware of. Um, but yeah, the also uh, servo technology, uh, I mean, the servo motors are very expensive. Someday down the road, if you have to replace a servo motor, it can be an extremely costly proposition. But uh, all things equal, if the prices are very close on the front end, I believe the servo technology really has <clears throat> the advantages that make it worth it for a lot of people. But I guess the short answer is yes. The, the, the link motion is, if cost is a real driver and uh, you just need to slow down through the material, other than that, I would go with the servo press. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about power consumption of a servo press versus the mechanical or hydraulic? I think that a lot of that is still uh, being discovered as well because um, all of your energy is being supplied by these servo motors. Um, you know, the pitch on servo motors as far as being more energy efficient is that you're not having to constantly spin a flywheel like you are with an mecha old mechanical press. You're constantly spinning a flywheel with the motor, whether you're running the press or not. Typically, people don't shut down their presses. They just sit there and let them run even when they're not running production. So you're using a lot of energy that way. But you got a question also, how are you using the servo press? If you're using the servo press all the time in production, which you hopefully are, you're going to be using it as much as you can during production, and the servo motor is supplying all of the energy, there's no energy being supplied by a flywheel, then you're using, depending on the work you're doing, you could be supplying a lot of energy through that servo motor. So I think it's, uh, there, there's going to be a lot of study done, and it's going to depend a lot on each individual 
customer and their their application and how they use the press. Okay. Um, can you talk about how the Siemens control drive package uh, stores energy? How does what's the energy storage solution there? Well, there they have actually there are quite a few different energy storing systems by Siemens and and probably some of the other manufacturers, but um, there's two basic schools of thought on on the energy storage, and one of them would be using large banks of capacitors, and which Siemens does it that way, but they also have a um, kinetic buffering system, which is basically a submotor that stores energy that you can draw on rather than capacitors storing the energy. Two different schools of thought. The kinetic buffering is uh, what a lot of people, some people are leaning towards, which we are now, because uh, we think it's going to be more energy efficient. The large capacitor banks also, uh, some you know companies really don't want to have these huge capacitor banks, which are uh, a lot of potential issues and safety issues and such as that. I see. So if you have the capacitor banks, can you switch over to the kinetic system, or you're stuck with the capacitor banks? You would be able to switch over, but it would, you know, you've already got a huge investment in the capacitor banks. What are you going to do with them? You're, I right. think you're better off to decide which way you want to go in the first place. Sure. Okay. And, and you know, the engineering and re-engineering, I'm sure, is, is when it may not be impossible or incredibly difficult, but I'm sure it's going to be costly and time consuming. Okay. Uh, so, so based on the applications that you've seen so far out in the marketplace, are, are there some parts or materials that you see um, where servo really is the only way to get some of these jobs done? You know, whether it's advanced high strength steels or complex deep draws or what have you. But are we starting to see applications now where servo is really the only way to, to get these jobs done? Yeah, I think you are, especially with a lot of these high strength steels where. Um, I mean, one one application where the servo motor can really shine with those is um, you, you've got an incredible amount of spring spring back mm -hmm. with these high strength steels, and, and they're difficult to form for that reason. The material just doesn't flow as well or quickly, and then again, it's it's uh, very elastic, so it wants to spring back. So those applications, and I I think it's a big reason you're seeing the servo presses being uh, looked at so hard in automotive. And then, um, you know, drawing, in, any drawing work when you can slow down your slide velocity to even to nothing, but just to near nothing, um, you know, you're, you're going to be able to draw and flow material better. And you're not losing any working energy with the servo press when you're doing that. So there are just myriad applications and uh, virtually probably most parts and most materials, there can be some tweaking done to improve the, the performance and the quality of the parts. Good, very good. All right, we have a few minutes left. Any other questions for Lee while we have him on the line here? Otherwise, uh, our, our uh, third and final webinar and then the live event again in Troy, we'll be able to explore uh, in more detail some of these applications that uh, that Lee talked about. All right. Well, we don't have any more questions at the moment. Um, if you do want to get in touch with Lee, um, you can uh, email the magazine or Lee. I don't know if you want to give out your email address or you want the questions to go through me and I can forward them on to you. Um, well, my email yeah, address you can is steveproven at, uh, at pma.org. I'm sorry. Say that again, Lee. Well, you can go to our website, uh, which is stamtech.com, and you can uh, write to us from there or give us a call anytime. All right. Sounds good. So I want to thank everybody again for attending today's program and, of course, thank Lee for, for his presentation. We hope everyone found uh, the presentation to be valuable. Uh, and, again, please remember that an archive of today's webinar will be available on our website within the next day or two, and we'll send you an email when uh, when that's up there so you can review what you learned today and share it with others within your company. 
Also, please visit our website, metalformingmagazine.com slash servo, to learn about next week's webinar, uh, the third and final webinar in the series. Uh, and you'll see uh, the agenda for the live event, which is coming up in Troy on October 13th. So again, please thank uh, Lee for his presentation, and you may close your browsers now. I hope everybody has a great afternoon.